With chapter nine, we're going to be looking at intimate partner violence. And I mentioned in a previous chapter that the term intimate partner violence is kind of a newer term. Instead of using the term wife batter or, or domestic violence, you're probably more familiar with domestic violence. And the problem with that definition is that it kind of suggested it had to be married, married partners living together. And it also implied only heterosexual couples. So with this new terminology that we use, intimate partner violence, it can be anybody in an intimate partner relationship. You don't have to be married. You don't have to be living together. It can be same sex. It can be heterosexual. So it's a more encompassing term. So that's what you'll see throughout the textbook and this chapter. So the definition, of course, is any behavior within an intimate relationship that causes physical, psychological, or sexual harm. It can include, of course, physical aggression, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, um, forced sexual intercourse, isolating a person from their family and friends, monitoring a person's movement, uh, you know, things like you know, keeping track of where they go, uh, putting things on their phone so you can track their phone, um, monitoring their email, restricting access to information or assistance, any of those things would uh, encompass intimate partner violence. Now, when it comes to the scope of the problem, when we talk about official statistics, and I, I think I've mentioned this previously, um, intimate partner violence is another one of those categories where it is highly underreported. So when you look at official statistics, kind of keep that in mind. This is one of those crime categories where we have a lot of that dark figure of crime, those never reported to the police. Um, some official statistics, intimate partner violence accounted for 22% of violent crimes against women and 4% of the violent crimes against men between 2001 and 2005. That's a lot of violence going on in intimate relationships. There was a survey done um, in uh, 2017, and remember surveys, when we survey people, um, we get more of the crimes that are not reported to the police. So a lot of people suggest that we get better statistics when we do surveys. This particular survey that was done in 2017, and it was done um, in, here in the United States, found that a third of women, 32%, had experienced um, some type of physical violence by an intimate partner. More than a quarter of the men, 28% in their lifetime, had experienced some type of violence in, um, in an intimate partner relationship. Uh, state estimates ranged from 25 to 42 per, 42% when you look at all of the different states for women um, uh, experience some type of abuse in a relationship at 17% to 36% for men. So that just suggests that perhaps these official reports are a lot lower. Um, and I think that we already knew that when we when we look at the, um, the research that suggests this is a highly underreported category of crime. Children were residents of households that experienced intimate partner violence in 38% of the incidents involving female victims. So um, there are often children in the house who are witnessing these events. And previously, we talked about the circle of violence, where people who experience violence in childhood often grow up and either continue to be victims or they become abusers themselves. And research has shown that children who just witness intimate partner violence in the household have a high risk of uh, being part of that circle of violence. There are actually some people in developmental psychology that suggest when we look at the types of abuse that we looked at in the chapter on, on child abuse and neglect, that witnessing um, intimate partner violence in the household should be considered a form of abuse. Now, when it comes to the legal response, um, you know, historically, and, and we're looking back a lot of years, but you know, historically, there was not a lot of um, attention from the criminal justice system given to particularly women who were abused by their partners. Now, luckily, that has changed here in the United States, although if you look across the world, there are many cultures in which women are abused and it's not a crime. But here in the United States, we have um, taken it more serious and created um, 
better laws and better enforcement of laws uh, to try to reduce intimate partner violence. Uh, training with police officers, we kind of talked about that in a previous chapter. But some of the changes that we've seen, mandatory arrest and charging uh, uh, for the perpetrators of intimate partner violence, whether they're male or female, protection orders, restraining orders to increase the safety of um, victims. Uh, protection orders and restraining orders um, are issued by the court uh, and they order the perpetrator to stay away from the victim. Now, of course, um, those or court orders are violated all the time, but they're put in place as a means for protecting the victim from the perpetrator. Uh, bans on gun ownership for uh, those who have been convicted of intimate partner violence, um, and really anybody that's conv been convicted of a felony. Mandatory reporting to child welfare services uh, when children have been exposed to intimate partner violence in the household, even if a child is not the victim themselves, it's still mandatory to report if you suspect that um, some type of violence is going on between the family members. Now, when it comes to the effects of intimate partner violence on victims, uh, you know, same effects that we've talked about um, when we talked about children. A lot of uh, women or men who experience intimate partner violence can go on to develop anxiety disorders, depression, uh, substance abuse issues, cutting behaviors, other self-injurious behaviors, including suicide or suicide attempts. That cycle of violence um, can lead to a syndrome that's a fairly new syndrome called battered woman syndrome. And it is um, considered to be, for a while, it was considered to be a part of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now it, in the DSM, it has its own category. It is considered to be an anxiety disorder. And it is when a person has experienced a cycle of violence with, um, with, with, with particular steps, and that you have, in order to qualify for a diagnosis, you have to have experienced these, this, this kind of cycle several times. So, tension building, actual battering, and then um, trying to make up for it, and then starting that cycle all over again. So it's, you know, starting to control the person, starting to tell them what to do, starting to break them down emotionally, going into actual physical, emotional, or sexual battering, and then saying, it'll never happen again. I'm so sorry. I love you. Stay with me. And then, you know, once things are calmed back down, it starts back over again. So if a woman or man has, but this has mostly been applied to, to women, experiences this cycle several times, they could be diagnosed with battered women's syndrome. Now, why this is important is twofold. Um, battered women's syndrome, women um, that uh, would qualify for this diagnosis, it explains why they don't try to leave relationships. Because when you are um, battered over a long period of time, something called learned helplessness can develop. Now, learned helplessness is a concept that was first discussed by um, Martin Seligman. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he's uh, kind of famous for being one of the founders of um, positive psychology. But before that, he, uh, back in the uh, 60s and 70s, he was doing research and he was doing research on dogs, uh, trying to classically condition dogs to be frightened by the sound. So it, in this experiment, they would put dogs on a shock plate. I know that sounds horrific, but they'd put dogs on a shock plate on a table that had kind of a net where one side had the shock plate. And if you jumped over the net, there was no shock plate. So in the initial phase, the dog was harnessed so that it couldn't escape the shock. So sound would happened, um, the shock would happen, and then they were trying to classically condition the dog to have this fear response where they could just make the sound and the dog would um, create, have fear. And of course, they were able to do this, but then they tried to, uh, to they took the harness off the dogs, expecting now that the dogs were not, um, you know, stuck on that side, that they would actually jump over and try to escape. But what they happened, what they what they saw was that the dogs, even though they weren't harnessed to the shock plate anymore, they wouldn't jump over. They would get shocked, and a lot of the dogs would actually just lay down and not even try to escape. They actually had to kind of physically pull the dog over the the um, the little um, thing that they had in the middle to get the dog to go over. 
So they they coined this behavior learn helplessness, and it's the idea that if you feel like there is nothing you can do to change your situation, you stop trying. The dogs who had been tethered to that side learned that they couldn't do anything to change their situation, so they stopped trying. Even when they were no longer tied to that side, they didn't even try. Now, this was later applied to victims of abuse, um, both adults and children, but for for battered women syndrome, um, a lot of women who have been abused for a long period of time um, just learn to accept that and they don't see a way out of it. They don't think that there's anything that they can do to change their situation, so they stop trying. So this can be the consequence of battered women's syndrome and why um, a lot of women stay in relationships and men um, instead when they could leave. It, it, and it kind of explains, sometimes we probably see stories and we're like, well, you know, she wasn't chained to the wall. Um, why didn't she leave? And it's probably this concept of learned helplessness. Now, the other reason that battered woman syndrome is important is because over the past few years, battered women syndrome has been um, used in courts as either a um, a justification for self-defense when a woman um, strikes back at, a, at an abuser or as justification for not guilty by reason of insanity when a woman strikes back at an abuser. Um, it's just the idea that women just, you know, experience kind of this this buildup over and over and over and and then they break and they have kind of this dissociative state. And there have been cases, many, where women have actually killed their abusers. And so we've seen battered women syndrome um, increasingly being used as a criminal defense to those types of charges. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, of course, also can develop. And we talked about that in a previous chapter. Post-traumatic stress disorder, if you remember, is an anxiety disorder. Um, it can um, cause a uh, increased startle response. People have intrusive flashbacks that they can't control. Uh, it can alter a person's self-perception, alter perceptions of the perpetrator, alter in relation with others, kind of just can alter it in terms of being battered. Um, your perception of yourself and others and your family members and friends, and really what happens a lot of the time when people are battered over a period, a long period of time, is their self-esteem really just, you know, takes a big nosedive. Um, they believe this person that's telling them over and over that they are worthless and that they're nothing and that nobody else will want them. So those are some of the effects of intimate partner violence. And, and this can last a very long time. Another thing that can happen is um, changes in your attachment style. Um, if you've ever studied developmental psychology, you'll know that attachment style is something that develops in infancy. And we can have, you know, healthy attachment styles or um, unhealthy attachment styles. And Sometimes you can have healthy attachment in childhood and then you grow up and you get into these abusive relationships and it changes your attachment style to one that's not healthy. And, um, and that's also an explanation of why people stay in relationships that are abusive um, in terms of having unhealthy attachment styles. Now, when it comes to intimate partner um, violence in um same sex relationships, there has not historically been a lot of research. Most of the research that's done on intimate pa partner violence is done on heterosexual couples. Now that's starting to change because the early um, studies and surveys and research suggested that intimate partner violence may be even higher in same sex relationships. So some of the statistics suggest that um, it occurs in 21 to 50 percent of uh, male same-sex relationships, and it could be even higher in female same-sex relationships. So we really need to do a lot more research and make a lot more efforts in terms of our social response and our legal response. They have found that social factors in isolation um, can make disclosure and he helps uh, uh, help seeking support more difficult. A lot of people don't feel like their um, their sexual orientation is accepted by others, and so they'll you know they'll not want to go out and seek help. Um, 
police may be less likely to intervene and charge in cases. Uh, in some states, there are some exclusions of same-sex partner form protection orders, which is ridiculous. Um, I, I think that these things are definitely going to change. Um, our social perception of same-sex relationship is changing. Um, and so we'll see more research in this area, um, more interventions, and definitely a change in the way that our legal system responds. Now, I mentioned that children who witness um, intimate personal violence, um, even if they are not a, um, abused themselves, they can have a lot of the same um, responses that we saw with actual child abuse when the child is the actual victim. So just witnessing it, as I said earlier, can actually lead to that circle of violence. Um, it can also lead to all of those other things that we talked about with children who experience um, abuse. Remember the depression, um, anxiety disorders, um, growing up if there's no intervention and having issues with drugs and alcohol, having issues with um, other, you know, other interpersonal relationships, um, social withdrawal, internalizing behaviors, um, hyperactivity, aggressive behaviors, violent behaviors, abusing other children, um, growing up to be an abuser, um, having problems with social relationships, low self-esteem, low school performance, all of those things that we talked about. Um, so that's really important. And I don't think a lot of people kind of understand that, that children just growing up in homes where it's taking place, um, it can have really devastating and lifelong, um, a lifelong impact on those children. Um, a continuum of intimate violence. Roberts and Roberts, um, found uh, with doing some interviews um, that there are some factors that are related to um, the risk for intimate partner violence. Um, and a lot of it was relation related to socioeconomic status. So I found low risk victims tend to have a higher level of education. The uh, violence tends to take place in dating relationships that they get out of and they tend to be middle or, or upper, upper class. So it doesn't mean if you are um, have a high level of education or that you are middle or upper class, upper class that you are immune to intimate partner violence, but the chances are that you will get out of that relationship. You wouldn't marry an abuse and a, a partner, um, according to this. High-risk victims tend to have lower levels of education, lower or middle class, and they tend to be married to or living with their abusive partners, um, and they probably feel as if, some studies have shown, they uh, don't have a lot of other choices, especially if they have children. Um, they don't have um, education. They don't have money. They don't feel like they can escape and take care of themselves or their children, so they are, are a little more likely to stay in those relationships because they you know, feel like they don't have a lot of other choices. Um, another continuum of violence, uh, and this is uh, different levels. So short term would be less than a year duration, usually college or high school students. There's typically one to three incidents. It's uh, physical things like pushing or shoving, sometimes hitting with an object. And the victim leaves after first, second or third incident um, and they don't get involved with a relationship like that again. Uh, level two, several months to two years of typically living together. There are three to 15 incidents of violence. There can be moderate to severe injury. Victim leaves uh, due to bruises or injuries. Um, level three, intermittent and long-term. So this is a long-term committed relationship. Maybe you have children, maybe you're married, maybe you're living together. Um, four to 30 incidents, severe and intense episode with no warning, long periods between episodes. They tend to stay in these relationships until their kids get older um, or they have some other type of support system, financial support system. Chronic and predictable would be level four. These are, again, long-term relationships, maybe religious or there may be a cultural element to it. Um, there are a lot of cultures where um, divorce is, or leaving a partner is really you know, not part of that culture. There are also cultures where um, you know, women are seen as um, subservient and they, um, you know, it's, it's not out of the norm in the, those cultures to treat women with violence. There are typically several hundred incidents of violence. It's frequent, it's predictable pattern of abuse, um, often involves substance abuse, 
Um, abuse continues until the abuser is arrested, dies, or is hospitalized. And then level five is the, um, the most serious, and this does happen, and that is when the victim, when, when there's some type of homicide. Uh, variable in terms of the relationship, but often a long-term relationship. There are numerous incidents of violence. The violence escalates to homicide and life-threatening injuries. And victims uh, tend to have limited resources, often suffer from PTSD or even battered women syndrome. All right, batter typologies. Um, and this is, uh, remember typologies are categories that are created um, to try to explain different types of offenders. And remember, not all offenders are the same, but these are some of the typical uh, types that um, have been discovered through research. So the family only batterer, um, there is violence in the relationship only or in the family only. Um, with this type of, with family only, it tends to have the lowest levels of psychological and uh, sexual abuse, uh, least violence outside the home. Most violence um, and battering tends to take place inside the home. Um, there's typically no psychopathology involved in this, violence resulting from a combination of stress and risk factors, things like um, being out of work, uh, ch um, childhood witnessing, uh, lack of relationship skills, lack of generalized hostility um, uh, to women, remorse leading to lower uh, risk of escalating violence. So these types of batterers are not violent outside the family. Um, they are violent towards their partner. Um, they tend to, after engaging in violence, and it's usually there's some type of stress, they don't have the coping mechanisms to deal with stress. Um, and so they lash out physically um, and then they feel bad about it. Um, and so it's least likely for this category to escalate to what we saw with the homicides. Dysphoric borderline, uh, moderate to severe wife abuse, uh, not much violence outside the home, so they don't tend to be violent um, with their friends and family members or in the community in general. They do tend to be more likely to have psychological disorders, substance abuse issues, suffer from depression, suffer from anxiety issues, or other mental health issues. They tend to have a background of parental abuse and rejection in their childhood, most likely to show uh, emotional instability, could suffer from something like borderline um, personality disorder. Um, and that involves emotional kind of up and downs with emotion, unstable relationships, fear of rejection, jealousy, um, being really controlling of a partner. And then we have the category that we worry about the most, and that is generally violent antisocial. They tend to have moderate to severe levels of violence in their relationships, highest levels of violence outside. So these are people that are generally violent with friends, family members, or just in their community. They're more likely to have antisocial personality disorder and to have a criminal record, to be involved in other types of criminal behaviors. Uh, they tend to have a high levels of uh, violence in their own childhood. They tend to have during childhood and even during adulthood associate with deviant peers and marital violence is part of a general use of aggression. These are just people that are um, just violent in general, antisocial in general. They tend to be um, involved in other types of criminal behaviors. And um, these are, this would be the category where we would see the highest levels of injury, the longest levels in terms of time frame of abuse and where it could escalate to homicide. Um, now, when we talk about homicide in the context of intimate, intimate partner violence, there are some risk factors associated with it escalating to intimate partner violence. Abusers um, who have a lower level of educa education, abusers who have access to firearms, um, abusers who use illicit drugs or alcohol, um, abusers who have been separated from victims. So if the victim leaves the abuser, goes to a shelter, goes to live with other family members, or just tries to escape, um, the abuser often seeks them out and, um, and that increases the risk that it could lead to homicide. When the abuser is highly, highly controlling, very jealous, um, 
does some of those things that I talked about earlier in terms of controlling behaviors like reading emails, reading text, having um, having access to passwords, things like that. That's high, highly controlling behavior. Um, no previous abuser arrests for intimate partner violence. Um, that's not always the case. A lot of times when, um, when it does escalate to homicide and they look at the offender's background, there have been um, incidents where the police have been called out to the home um, for previous incidents of uh, violence in the household. Um, having a stepchild in the home is a risk factor and the abuser previously threatened the victim with a weapon or threatened to harm them. Um, that also increases the risk that this could escalate to homicide. Now, I mentioned that one of the reasons that battered women syndrome has become increasingly important is because it has been used as a criminal defense. Um, so there are elements of battered women syndrome um, used in, again, either for not guilty by reason of insanity or as, um, as evidence of uh, self-defense. So you would have to, if you use this as a defense, you would have to um, document that uh, that battered women syndrome exists by showing um, evidence that the woman has experienced these cycles of abuse. Um, you'd have to uh, show that she has experienced um, some of those symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Remember, post-traumatic stress disorder and battered women syndrome are very closely aligned in terms of the symptoms, and they're both now considered to be anxiety disorders. Um, so it, it, it is interesting um, to see this used as a defense. And again, in most cases, it is either for self-defense or not guilty by reason of insanity. There was actually a case here in Tennessee um, where uh, the, a, a woman who had been battered for a long, very long period of time and it had been documented, documented with injuries and visits to hospitals and things like that. And she was married to a preacher and she shot him in the back. Now, typically, when you shoot somebody in the back, um, that is premeditated. Um, but she was able to successfully use battered women's syndrome because there was documented evidence uh, that she had been battered over a long period of time. All right, intervention programs for intimate partner personal violence, and it's really looking at different aspects. So, um, programs for children who witness violence, um, aimed at really kind of preventing them from developing a circle of violence and, of course, treating them for anxiety disorders, depression, um, with withdrawal, problems with school. We really want to prevent any of those issues from escalating um, and carrying on into adulthood. Programs for victims of violence, um, usually uh, at the beginning, they're aimed at providing emergency assistance, making sure that the victim is safe and away from the abuser, and then offering um, other types of services, um, counseling services, um, shelter services, access to education or training programs. There are a lot of women shelters that um, have women from the community come in and help people build resumes, um, help them go to uh, get funding to go to trade school so that they can um, take care of themselves financially and their children if necessary. And then we also have programs for batterers aimed at stopping the violent behavior um, so that uh, that, that does not um, continue, especially if the relationship between the two people is going to continue. Um, so we want to, of course, first and foremost, ensure safety, and that can include hotlines that victims can call to get um, to get intervention. We have a lot of shelters that have been um, opened across the country for victims and their children, if necessary. Relocation services, um, if somebody needs to move out of the community because they don't feel safe, there are a lot of um, programs, uh, typically private programs that help with funding these types of services. And then ongoing treatment counseling really to help people with the, you know, with the, with the long-term impact of being battered in a relationship. So remember I told you that self-esteem really takes a dive. So enhancing self-esteem, recognizing that you have been the victim of violence and that you didn't deserve it. A lot of people were told over and over and over that 
they brought this on themselves. They deserved that. They, you made me do it changing attitudes and behaviors about uh, relationships, about violence, about what's appropriate in relationships, reducing that isolation. Um, remember that's part of a batterer's MO is reduce, you know, making the victim isolated from family and friends. So trying to reduce that isolation, make those connections back with family members, with friends, um, and uh, even other women that have been victims normalizing the woman's experience and then providing options in terms of, um, again, like what I was talking about, um, if she needs educational options, training options, uh, help with resumes. There are programs where uh, they have clothes for women, um, where they uh, help them dress for uh, and train for job interviews, really just trying to get women back on their feet um, help them become financially independent so that they don't feel like they have to rely on another person. Intervention for children who witness interpersonal violence. Of course, we have the crisis in intervention. Making sure that they're safe is the first um, thing we need to do. Getting them in a, uh, a, a safe setting, normalizing their feelings, um, getting them to talk about their feelings, getting them to understand that that type of um, behavior in intimate relationships is not normal. It is abnormal. The problem a lot of times is if you grow up seeing that, you you have this cognitive script that that's how people are in intimate relationships, that that's how people deal with stress, that that's how people communicate with each other. And of course, that puts you at risk for growing up and doing those things yourself or getting into a relationship where that happens to you because you think that that's normal. That's what you witnessed as a child develop a plan um, for the child where, um, you know, where they're getting therapy, they're getting interventions. Um, also, uh, you know, getting them to a safe place along with the parents um, as well, the parent who's typically also been abused. Ongoing um, group or individual treatment. So this would be um, therapy. And the type of therapy will really kind of depend on the child's age um, do they have language skills yet? Um, so that will kind of uh, uh, depend on the child's age. Um, and then parent-child groups um, where this is counseling where both the parent and the child goes. And that could be, by the way, the battering parent as well if there is hope that the family can remain together by treating everybody in the family. But it usually is with the child and the, uh, the parent that who has been battered. And it's really to try to um, create better parenting skills and enhance the bond between the parent and the child. Now, intervention for offenders. Um, <clears throat> there, there are a lot of times that families want to try to stay together. And even if families don't try to stay together um, and a partner leaves a batterer, we want to reduce the risk that that's going to happen again from that batterer. So some of the types of interventions through counseling would be anger management counseling, cognitive behavioral approaches. Again, remember cognitive behavioral approaches are the gold standards in therapy because they address um, any, any issues with cognition. So maybe any um, ideas um, the batterer has, particularly men, I'm not picking on men, but men have about women being subservient, being property. Um, so kind of changing any, you know, any maladaptive beliefs that somebody has about relationships, about um, conflict, about communication. Um, and then uh, psychoeducational approaches, and this is uh, just using some type of psychotherapy to address any behavioral issues, any issues with cognition. Remember, psycho psycho psychotherapy is any kind of talk therapy, but the vast majority of them are going to be cognitive behavioral approaches that include anger management because anger management is often an issue, and teaching appropriate communication skills, uh, teaching um appropriate uh, methods for dealing with stress, because stress is often a trigger. Some of the contra controversies involved with trying to treat batterers, um, ignoring the context of the abuse and teaching more uh, sophisticated modes of control. Most therapies actually do address these things, but it definitely is something to keep in mind. And there are also those who suggest that, um, you know, batterers, especially the, the more dangerous batterers that we've talked about who tend to be just pervasively angry, 
um, and pervasively violent, not just inside the home, but outside the home, and already have a criminal history um, engaging in other types of criminal activities, there are a lot of people that suggest they cannot be treated. All right, so difficult chapter. A lot of our chapters are going to be difficult. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, have a great rest of the day.